The BHK Signature uh, amplifier name came about because I was so enthralled with how good this amplifier was sonically. I mean, it really, uh, really, really sounded good and it had the absolute uh, uh, endorsement of my good friend Arnold Udell. He thought it was really wonderful to the point where he was the one who said he'd never sell his prize tube amplifiers and he now has done so. And with all that in mind, I said, yeah, I'll put the BHK on there. This is a great amp. I love it. So I'm, I'm quite good with that at this point. A little reluctant at first, but not in the end. <laughs> 30-something 30, 30 years ago, you built the HCA, uh, which was similar. And, and have you been thinking about it all this time? The HCA is really a very different different design well, in, in that all of the tube circuitry in that one had all the voltage gain and the output stage was a gain of one typical emitter fall or a complementary arrangement. That, a lot of hybrids that have been made since that, Counterpoint made them and, and there were others, Moscode, would have a topology sort of like that. Okay. This amplifier came about with a tube in front of it uh, because uh, we was doing research and with uh, different headphone amplifiers and I designed a headphone amplifier that had had a tube input stage and it had and that was the input stage but it was included in the overall feedback loop and there was another headphone amplifier that didn't do it that way that we thought was the best sounding one that was out there as a pathos aurium which I still have one, and Arnold has one as a prime one that we use. That one had the tube providing all the voltage gain, and that one had a follower, but yet it worked really well. That tube was out of the feedback loop. So when the uh, BHK signature idea came along that for that amplifier, that, that had a solid state output stage that had a, a voltage gain of about eight times rather than the usual 26, 20 times of a regular power amplifier. So it turned out that a tube stage ahead of it, or a solid state stage if you would, outside of that basic output stage core, needed a gain of only about four, you know, four or five. And that was easy to do. The tubes uh, was very degenerated. You know, it could produce a lot more voltage gain than that. So it had low distortion and great uh, push-pull balance, meaning that the output phases were equal whether you fed it balanced or unbalanced. Just what we need, because the output amplifier are two separate phases that need to be driven balanced. And so that's part of how all that came to be. Uh, and and but how that output stage came to be that was something that for another client i developed uh, this circuit that for that client i was trying to make an amplifier that had a driver transformer a very good lundahl transformer which are one of the best ones out there to drive a pair of very large same sex in channel mosfets well i worked on that and i couldn't get enough stability uh, in that circuit to do what it had to do and I, I had to abandon it and I said what am I going to do for this client and I remembered a circuit that was way back 30 years or so that uh, originated with a Spectrasonics uh, mixing board uh, voltage amplifier card that they made it was a 110 card I believe and that had this topology which which basically would drive same sex output transistors or transistors in that case with a differential pre-driver stage that would put uh, equal current into both of these devices in a very linear way. And I actually, with Jim Bongiorno and another friend, built for my, had built for myself a Class A amplifier for about 35 watts that did that with bipolar outputs, and it sounded really good. So I remembered that, and I said, you know what? An epiphany came upon me that if I use that kind of a circuit with all MOSFET devices, I'll bet it would be really good. And I immediately set to work with some of the modern uh, big uh, in-channel MOSFETs and it worked right off the bat. And in short order, you know, I had this all working and that led to a design that that client was very happy with. 
So I used a similar kind of a topology based on that success of that in the PS Audio amp using different kinds of brands of devices and different ways to connect them. But it still was all MOSFET. And with that tube front end, which I believe Arnold O'Dell suggested, because we were working together on the headphone amps, says, Baskin, that's what you're going to do. Okay, and I remember proposing that to Paul McGowan. And he says, what? You know, we thought he was going to free. And he said, you know what? Let's do it. <laughs> and oh boy, the rest is history. And this amp is just such a sweetheart. Man, I just love mine. You know, I couldn't part with it. Um, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, why MOSFETs? That's a good question. That's a good question. A lot of Jim Bongiorno hated MOSFETs as a, as a matter of interest. And uh, I tried to actually use MOSFETs with some of his designs, and, and he wouldn't pay me for it, the work that I did. <laughs> oh, God. But anyway, there's something about them. First of all, I just know they sound good. And I've made a lot of circuits with them, uh, you know, before and after doing this PS Audio amp or doing it on headphone amplifiers, and they've all just worked well. And I can't explain technically why they do. You'd think one of the properties that they have is that they have a high input impedance, but they have a lot of capacitance, which means that high frequencies, they're hard to drive, you know, even though you think, well, it doesn't take anything to drive, and well, it does. So, but other than that, you know, they, they just... They're, they're not any more linear than transistors, necessarily, but they just sound better, and I don't know why. It's the honest truth. Like, well, what's the difference between a MOSFET and a bipolar transistor? Well, the, the solid-state uh, essence of them is entirely different. A transistor has a base and emitter junction that, that has a voltage drop of around maybe six-tenths of a volt when it's active. Whereas the MOSFET doesn't have that kind of a junction. It just has, has a gate that will control the current between the source and the drain by the voltage. It's more like a vacuum tube in that sense. You know, whereas a transistor has got uh, holes and electrons and it's a different, totally different physical uh, solid state technology kind of a thing. So, and in the case of the MOSFETs used in a power amplifier, a very interesting problem. Oh, this is interesting. If you were to make this circuit with bipolar transistors, it would have to be operated Class A. It would have to be operated Class A. And the reason is that the driver has certain currents that are that at the idle currents are equal, and they drive each of the output devices to some conduction level. When you modulate this circuitry fully, one of these currents doubles and the other one goes to zero. And that means that in terms of what the currents happen to the output stage, it can only double. So if you were idling at 100 mils, or you could only double it to 200 mils. And that's only going to get you 200 milliamps times 8 ohms is not very many watts. So if you operated at class A, let's say, with a plus or minus 40 volt supply, you're talking two or three amps of current all the time that can double to six amps. Now you can get clipping all the way class A. Well, with MOSFETs, uh, if, if, if you use linear MOSFETs, the same condition would apply. You'd have to run at class A. But these newer MOSFETs uh, have the property that that they're, they're actually quite nonlinear, such that if you had, for instance, uh, the gate voltage for the idling current that you wanted, maybe a couple hundred milliamps, let us say, and there's three volts to get it. Now, remember, these currents that are going to drive this can double that three volts in full modulation. That's six volts. Well, when you put six volts on the gate, it can, it can deliver amps. I mean, tens of amps. So it just becomes easy. You can operate it all the way from class B. And we've chosen to operate them in a, in a class A, B mode with an actually modest idling current. I mean, it's, it's, it dissipates quite a bit of heat, but it, uh, it all works out just perfectly for this mode of operation. And that's unique. I mean, it's unique. And, and this circuit is, is very, very different, totally different than any other power amplifier. I mean, most power amplifiers, all the other ones have got... Uh, com complementary uh, output MOSFETs as followers. 
Yeah, well, there's a few that did it as in a different mode, but they're exceedingly rare. But nothing like this circuit, and it all just works. And it works magnificently. Say, so why not have just built this amp Class A? Well, because for one thing, it would uh, require much more heat sinking than the package design that was uh, set forth for this amplifier. I mean, it would have to be huge. If it was not uh, forced air cool, like the Infinity Hybrid Class A was, that amplifier had 300 watts of idling dissipation in each channel, and it was uh, it had was forced air cooling, and it made quite a lot of noise, and it drew about seven or eight hundred watts off the AC line. Well, uh, it, it just wasn't in the cards to do this. Uh, would I have liked to do it that way? No, I, I really never even thought of doing it that way. When I found out how the MOSFETs worked, which I had just talked about, you know, where you could run them uh, at a much lower uh, class of operation than full class A, and it worked and, and it measured and worked and sounded so good, I I didn't think that it was practical to think about trying to make a class A, I mean, because it would really, <laughs> if it was a, it would just have to be you know, three or four times the size, and it would be huge. But other companies have made really big mother amps like that. You know, well, maybe we'll do that someday. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know, a smaller one, you know, maybe, maybe 50, 100 watts. But is there any advantage to it? Well, there's something about Class A that, uh, yeah, there is an advantage. I mean, it's more inherently linear. I mean, it really, it really is. I mean, there isn't any kind of a crossover distortion kind of a thing in a Class A amplifier. And... Uh, Different Class A amplifiers over the years have sounded very good, but so have other kind of classes of operation. All it's all the tube amps. I mean, virtually all the tube amps operate in Class Class A B. A very few have been Class A. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's a it's, it's a practical consideration to really get into it. They do, but I mean, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to trying that at some point. Tell us the difference from your perspective of what you hear. Uh, from the solid state input versus the tube input on this design? Well, I've listened to a design like this uh, quite a bit um, without a tube front end, and it's very, very good. But the tube front end just opens it up, gives it more space, and it makes the overall sound much more musically believable. I mean, it's very, very, very a strong difference. You know, it really is, and so it is it's absolutely worthwhile doing because it makes the overall performance and the sound get to a much higher level. Why? <laughs> Why? Because it's a tube, damn it. Tubes sound good. <laughs> it's that simple.